Hi! In today's lecture, we're going to talk about styling your text on your web pages. One of the best and easiest ways to really make your page look a little bit different than the standard default is to think about how you might want to style your text to kind of bring maximum impact. So there are many, many options. We're going to talk about some of them today. One of those options is to think about basically your font. Um, some of the things you can style are the font family, the font style, the font variant, and the font size. We can also think about styling the color and background of your font. We can talk about alignment as well. And finally, we're going to talk very briefly about line height. These are all four things that you can do to just really kind of highlight or emphasize the different things you would like your style to bring about. So first, let's talk about font family. Font families are just different types of text. So if you've used Word before, you've gone in, you've gone to font family, and you can pick Arial or Wingdings or all these different types of fonts. You can do the same things on your web page. So I've got a couple of examples up here for you. Um, the more common, you have Helvetica, Courier, Courier New, Comic Sans, Cursive, or Verdana. I've tried to put the font type here in the slide, but it might be kind of hard for you to see. And I wanted, I kind of did that on purpose, because what looks obvious to you when you're designing doesn't always look obvious to the people who are looking at your page. I also picked these particular ones because I wanted to show you that some are a single word, such as Helvetica, but Comic Sans MS is multiple words, so I had to put it inside quotes. All right. So how it works is, again, you use your syntax rule. You have your selector, your property, and then your value. So in this case, I've said, whenever you see an H1 heading, don't use the browser default heading. Instead, I want you to use the Arial font. So it changes the font slightly to look like this example here. Now, every single browser doesn't support everything. We've seen this even with HTML5. Some browsers support some tags, some don't. In the same way, some browsers support some fonts and others don't as well. So what you can do is you can provide alternatives. In this example, I've given the browser three different alternatives to use. I'm basically saying, whenever you come up to an H1 tag, I really want you to use the courier font. But if you don't have the courier font, go ahead and use the impact font. If you don't have that one, go ahead and use Arial. Now, one of the questions you might ask yourself is, what if it doesn't have any three of these fonts? It doesn't have courier, impact, or Arial. Well, if you remember, when we first talked about cascading style sheets, we said if you give it a rule and it can't support it, it will always go back to the browser default. So you don't need to worry about you know, uh, font disappearing because you gave it a bad font family. It'll always come through. So when you pick your font families, there's a few things you should think about. The first one, and maybe the most important, is some fonts are much more user friendly than others. There are basically two categories. You have serif fonts and sans serif fonts. The serif fonts are the ones that have the kind of the fancy edges along the side that you use when you were learning calligraphy or different things like that. The sans serif fonts are very clean. There's no drop downs or anything like that. So when it comes time for someone to blow your page up, kind of really go in and, and um, trying to think of the right way. when they want to go in and they want to make it look bigger. Um, serif fonts can really get messy, so avoid those whenever possible. I personally don't use custom fonts myself, but I've never been an artsy type of person. So if you do decide that you want to have your own font or some sort of special web safe custom font, you need to use something special here called a font face rule. And what we do is you can see in the first example, you say, hey, I'm going to define my own font face. I'm going to happen to call it my special font. You could call it anything you wanted to call it. <clears throat> and then you need to give it a source. So that source, this is a new one you haven't seen before. We're not using href. We're not using source. We're using URL. And the URL says, this is where you can find the file that defines my special font. Once you do that, once you write the font face rule once throughout the rest of your style sheet, you can go ahead and reference it. So now, every time I use an H1 font, you're going to use my special font. So now, let's talk about font style. It's a much fancier word than you might expect, but we're simply talking about do you want your font to look normal, which is the default, do you want it to be italic, or do you want it to be oblique, which is basically just a special kind of italic. So normal font will happen no matter what, it's just how it's going to be. Um, if someone else has written a style sheet and they've made it all italic, that's when you might want to say, no, no, I'm going to overwrite it and make it normal. Italic is always a certain kind of uh, leaning lean, basically, to your font. And oblique is when you really want to be extra special and define exactly what angle you want to have your, your text lean towards. 
the font variant is, we really only have two options here. We have normal and we have small caps. People use this quite a bit when they're trying to do very consistent and yet somewhat fancy look to it. So here I've said again, always using H1, I want my font variant to be small caps. So now when you look at my text, my H1 text down at the bottom, I've written H1 small caps variation. But when the browser displays it, it's going to display it in small caps. So this keeps you from having to go back and forth and remembering to change all your text to uppercase or lowercase. It doesn't matter how you write it, the browser will always show it in uppercase. Now font size is something that we'll be talking about pretty much throughout this entire course and in other courses we're going to be doing as well, such as responsive design, because it's really a lot of different ways to do it. So let's just start with the most basic. Um, your options are you can use font size equals extra, extra small, extra small, small, and smaller. I don't really like those very much because it doesn't really give me a frame of reference. You can have medium, you can have large, extra large, XX large, and larger. Very few people use these options, but they're out there, so I wanted to tell you what they were. Instead, what many people use is they use pixels. So I'm going to include on the website this nice kind of table for you that relates how many pixels to an inch, how many pixels to picos, so you can get a feel for it. But most people will do something along the lines of 20 pixels, 35 pixels, 80 pixels. And this is a very consistent look, and it's something that people can kind of feel what it should look like. However, I tend to use percentages instead. Percentages are going to allow us to change the font size as we resize the screen much more easily. So if you were to say use 100%, it's going to be the default size. If you say use 110%, it'll be slightly larger. Use, if you were to use 75%, you know, it'd be 3 quarters the size. Next, let's talk about color and background color. Um, the color attribute is the color of the foreground, which is the fancy word for just the text itself. Right. The background color is the color of the background behind the font that we're looking at. And depending on what kind of text you're styling, it can look very different. So here I've done one rule, and you haven't seen this before. I'm going to go ahead and style two different selectors. I'm going to style H1 and span. So if you put a comma right there, I've got it right here between the H1 and the span. You can put as many commas as you want and write as many selectors as you want. And in this case, I've said, hey, I want my color to be blue and I want my background color to be gray. And if you're not sure where these strange numbers came from, go watch the colors video. It'll explain everything for you there. So now I've gone in, and in my HTML, I have colors in an H1 tag, and I have the word inline inside of span tag. And what I want you to notice is that for the H1, the block element, the background color covers the whole width of the page. But for span, for inline elements, it, the background color only goes around just the element in the text itself. Okay. Next, let's talk about aligning text. Aligning text is simple. It's, it's probably one of the easiest things you can do in HTML, and you're going to be really happy because later when you decide that you want to align other things, it's so hard, and you're just going to want to put everything in text. So your options are, when you use text align, you can use left, which means just align the text to the left. That's what we do already. You can have right, which means align everything to the right, center, and justify. Center everything just as much as you along the middle of that division. Justify tries to spread it out to use as much space as possible. So let me show you some examples, because that's really the best way to understand what's going on here. Here, I've got a left alignment. Everything lines up along the left-hand side of the screen. The next one, I've used text align equals right, and you can see that everything is lined up to the right. It looks really weird. There's very few reasons you're going to use this unless you have something else kind of going along in the side in the, in the middle here. The next one we're going to do is center. Um, people use center quite a bit. They almost use it too much, but it is a nice way to kind of break up your text and have it look a little bit different. So justify, it's really hard to explain, and even when you first look at it, you might not notice what's going on. But with Justify, the browser is putting in little bits of extra space to kind of help to kind of help you spread it out so it has the exact same width all the way along. So I'm going to show you the Justified with the left, and I think that's the best way to kind of see the difference. Is that you have you basically don't have the empty space here. They've kind of spread it out over here, so no one place has too much blank space. All right. 
Next, we're going to talk about line height. And line height is really different because it's not affecting the font itself. It's not affecting your text. It's affecting how much space is around your text. Some of you may have used Word before, and you can go and you kind of just how much space there is between the lines. Maybe you want it to be one line, one and a half line, double space. That's what we're talking about here. So my first example, I said line height equals 50%. And the next one, I said line height equals 200%. So in the first rule, that's kind of a weird rule to write, because I'm saying I want things to overlap with each other. In the second rule, I'm saying I want you to really spread out far. Oops. All right. Um, I'm going to go ahead and put an example later online where I can show you exactly how these things would look. Or even better, I'm just going to turn this into a teachable moment and have you go in there and type it yourself and kind of look at how these, these two different rules affect the text. Okay. So let's review. I know. I went over a lot of things, and it can be overwhelming. So one of the most important things is, with everything we do in this course, is take five, 10 minutes, type some stuff in, take a look and see what happens. Make as many mistakes as you can, because this is the time to make mistakes when you've got me and the rest of the crowd here to answer the questions on the, on the different boards. Practice on toy problems. Don't make a huge web page and try to style it. Create a page with three, four paragraphs, a couple links, and practice on those. Because it doesn't matter. You don't need to practice on a big page. You can practice on the small problems, and it really makes a big difference. All right. And finally, if you decide that you're ready to code and you are ready to do that large project, make sure you design your larger projects on paper first. I can't stress enough that if you start coding and styling without really having a clear plan, it's real, you're just going to get very frustrated and hopefully, not hopefully, you'll get very frustrated and you'll quit. And I don't want you to do that. So plan all your projects on paper first. If you follow these, these suggestions, if you practice, practice, if you do toy problems, if before you jump into big problems, you sketch it out first, I think you're going to have a lot of fun and you're going to have a really great page that you're going to be proud of.